9a gift of love can i see my baby the happy new mother asked when the bundle was nestled in her arms and she moved the fold of cloth to look upon his tiny face she gasped the doctor turned quickly and looked out the tall hospital window the baby had been born without ears time proved that the baby's hearing was perfect it was only his appearance that was marred when he rushed home from school one day and flung himself into his mother's arms she sighed knowing that his life was to be a succession of heartbreaks he blurted out the tragedy a boy a big boy called me a freak he grew up handsome except for his misfortune a favorite with his fellow students he might have been class president but for that he developed a gift a talent for literature and music but you might mingle with other young people his mother reproved him but felt a kindness in her heart the boy's father had a session with the family physician could nothing be done i believe i could graft on a pair of outer ears if they could be procured the doctor decided so the search began for a person who would make such a sacrifice for a young man two years went by then you're going to the hospital son mother and i have someone who will donate the ears you need but it's a secret said the father the operation was a brilliant success and a new person emerged his talents blossomed into genius and school and college became a series of triumphs later he married and entered the diplomatic service but i must know he asked his father who gave me the ears who gave me so much i could never do enough for him i do not believe you could said the father but the agreement was that you are not to know dot not yet the years kept their profound secret but the day did come one of the darkest days that ever passed through a son he stood with his father over his mother's casket slowly tenderly the father stretched forth a hand and raised the thick reddish brown hair to reveal taht the mother had no outer ears mother said she was glad she never let her hair be cut he whispered gently and nobody ever thought mother less beautiful did they a father and a son passing through the atlanta airport one morning i caught one of those trains that take travelers from the main terminal to their boarding gates free sterile and impersonal the trains run back and forth all day long not many people consider them fun but on this saturday i heard laughter at the front of the first car looking out the window at the track that lay ahead were a man and his son they had just stopped to let off passengers and the doors we closing again here we go hold on to me tight the father said the boy about five years old made sounds of sheer delight i know we're supposed to avoid making racial distinctions these days so i hope no one will mind if i mention that most people on the train were white dressed for business trips or vacations and that the father and son were black dressed in clothes that were just about as inexpensive as you can buy look out there the father said to his son see that pilot i bet he's walking to his plane the son craned his neck to look as i got off i remembered something i'd wanted to buy in the terminal i was early for my flight so i decided to go back i did and just as i was about to reboard the train for my gate i saw that the man and his son had returned too i realized then that they hadn't been heading for a flight but had just been riding the shuttle you want to go home now the father asked i want to ride some more more the father said mock exasperated but clearly pleased you're not tired this is fun his son said all right the father replied and when a door opened we all got on there are parents who can afford to send their children to europe or disneyland and the children turn out rotten there are parents who live in million dollar houses and give their children cars and swimming pools yet something goes wrong where are all these people going daddy the son asked all over the world came the reply the other people in the airport we leaving for distant destinations or arriving at the ends of their journeys the father and son though were just riding this shuttle together making it exciting sharing each other's company here was a father who cared about spending the day with his son and who had come up with this plan on a saturday morning parents who care enough to spend time and to pay attention and to try their best it doesn't cost a cent yet it is the most valuable thing in the world the train picked up speed and the father pointed something out and the boy laughed again 11. a fib 
I was six years old and my sister, Sally Kay, was a submissive three, for some reason, I thought we needed to earn some money. I decided we should, hire out, as maids. We visited the neighbors, offering to clean houses for them for a quarter cents. Reasonable as our offer was, there were no takers. But one neighbor telephoned mother to let her know what Mary Alice and Sally Kay were doing. Mother had just hung up the phone when we came bursting through the back door, into the kitchen of our apartment. Girls, mother asked, why were you two going around the neighborhood telling people you would clean their houses? Mother wasn't angry with us. In fact, we learned afterwards, she was amused that we had come up WIH such an idea. But, for some reason, we both denied having done any such thing. Shocked and terribly hurt that her dear little girls could be such bold-faced liars. Mother then told us that Mrs. Jones had just called to tell her we had been to her house and said we would clean it for a quarter. Faced with the truth, we admitted what we had done. Mother said that we had fibbed. We had not told the truth. She was sure that we knew better. She tried to explain why a fib hurt but she didn't feel that we really understood. Years later, she told us that the lesson she came up with for trying to teach us to be truthful would probably have been frowned upon by child psychologists. The idea came to her in a flash, and our tender-hearted mother told us it was the most difficult lesson she ever taught us. It was a lesson we never forgot. After admonishing us, mother cheerfully began preparing for lunch. As we munched on sandwiches, she asked, would you two like to go to TH Moives this afternoon? Wow. Would we ever? We wondered what movie would be playing. Mother said the matinee. Oh, fantastic. We would be going to the matinee. Weren't we lucky? We got bathed and all dressed up. It was like getting ready for a birthday party. We hurried outside the apartment, not wanting to miss the bus that would take us downtown. On the landing, mother stunned us by saying, girls, we are not going to the movies today. We didn't hear her right. What, we objected. What do you mean? Aren't we going to the matinee? Mommy, you said we were going to go to the matinee. Mother stooped and gathered us in her arms. I couldn't understand why there were tears in her eyes. We still had time to get the bus. But hugging us, she gently explained that this was what a fib felt like. It is important that what we say is true, mother said, I fibbed to you just now and it felt awful to me. I don't ever want to fib again and I'm sure you don't want to fib again either. People must be able to believe each other. Do you understand? We assured her that we understood. We would never forget. And since we had learned the lesson. Why not go on to the matinee? There was still time. Not today, mother told us. We would go another time. That is how, over 50 years ago, my sister and I learned to be truthful. We have never forgotten how much a fib can hurt. A forever friend. A friend walk in when the rest of the world walks out. Sometimes in life. You find a special friend. Someone who changes your life just by being part of it. Someone who makes you laugh until you can't stop. Someone who makes you believe that there really is good in the world. Someone who convinces you that there really is an unlocked door just waiting for you to open it. This is forever friendship. When you feel blue. And the world seems dark and empty. Your forever friend lifts you up in spirits and makes that dark and empty world suddenly seem bright and full. Your forever friend gets you through the hard times, the sad times, and the confused times. If you turn and walk away. Your forever friend follows. If you lose you way. Your forever friend guides you and cheers you on. Your forever friend holds your hand and tells you that everything is going to be okay. And if you find such a friend. You feel happy and complete. Because you need not worry. You have a forever friend for life. And forever has no end. 13 That's what friends do. Jack tossed the papers on my desk, his eyebrows knit into a straight line as he glared at me. What's wrong? I asked. He jabbed a finger at the proposal. Next time you want to change anything, ask me first, he said, turning on his heels and leaving me stewing in anger. How dare he treat me like that, I thought. I had changed one long sentence, and corrected grammar, something I thought I was paid to do. It's not that I hadn't been warned. 
The other woman who had worked my job before me called Jack names I couldn't repeat. One co-worker took me aside the first day. He's personally responsible for two different secretaries leaving the firm, she whispered. As the weeks went by, I grew to despise Jack. It was against everything I believed in, turning the other cheek and loving your enemies. But Jack quickly slapped a verbal insult on any cheek turned his way. I prayed about, but to be honest, I wanted to put Jack in his place, not love him. One day another of his episodes left me in tears. I stormed into his office, prepared to lose my job if needed, but not before I let the man know how I felt. I opened the door and Jack glanced up. What, he said abruptly. Suddenly I knew what I had to do. After all, he deserved it. I sat across from him, Jack, the way you've been treating me is wrong. I've never had anyone speak to me that way. As a professional, it's wrong, and it's wrong for me to allow it to continue. Jack snickered nervously and leaned back in his chair. I closed my eyes briefly. God help me, I prayed. I want to make you a promise. I will be a friend. I said. I will treat you as you deserve to be treated, with respect and kindness. You deserve that. Everybody does. I slipped out of the chair and closed the door behind me. Jack avoided me the rest of the week. Proposals, specs, and letters appeared on my desk while I was at lunch, and my corrected versions were not seen again. I brought cookies to the office one day and left a batch on his desk. Another day I left a note. Hope your day is going great, it read. Over the next few weeks, Jack reappeared. He was reserved, but there were no other episodes. Co-workers cornered me in the break room. Guess you got to Jack, they said. You must have told him off good. I shook my head. Jack and I are becoming friends. I said in faith. I refused to talk about him. Every time I saw Jack in the hall, I smiled at him. After all, that's what friends do. One year after our talk, I discovered I had breast cancer. I was 32, the mother of three beautiful young children, and scared. The cancer had metastasized to my lymph nodes and the statistics were not great for long-term survival. After surgery, I visited with friends and loved ones who tried to find the right words to say. No one knew what to say, and many said the wrong things. Others wept, and I tried to encourage them. I clung to hope. The last day of my hospital stay, the door opened and Jack stood awkwardly under the threshold. I waved him in with a smile. He walked over to my bed and without a word placed a bundle beside me. Inside the package lay several bulbs. Tulips, he said. I smiled, not understanding. He cleared his throat. If you plant them when you get home, they'll come up next spring. He shuffled his feet. I just wanted you to know that I think you'll be there to see them when they come up. Tears clouded my eyes and I reached out my hand. Thank you, I whispered. Jack grasped my hand and gruffly replied, you're welcome. You can't see it now, but next spring you'll see the colors I picked out for you. He turned and left without another word. I have watched those red and white striped tulips push their way through the soil every spring for over 10 years now. In fact, this September the doctor will declare me cured. I've seen my children graduate from high school and enter college. In a moment when I prayed for just the right word, a man with very few words said all the right things. After all, that's what friends do.